Aloha, welcome to another talk session, a talk story session uh, to share, share to inspire. And I have a very special guest with me today, a very good friend from way back. Uh, way back, how way back? Uh, we look, we're talking about high school days. And um, this fella here, it has tons of stories. And I'm not going to be surprised at what stories he's going to share. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to look forward to those stories. And I have a few stories to share as well. <laughs> um, but what I... Um, would like to just as a reminder about this session is that hopefully through this Talanoa or talk story session, uh, we hope that by sharing my guest, by sharing his story, that it will inspire you to go for it and to reach your goal. Um, so when I first met this guy, uh, I was just during the high school days, he was the tallest guy out in the group of boys that I met. Um, and I have proof, well, I don't have proof, but I have a memory uh, there was this one dance or a social where he was at and the boys and this fella was in the middle of the pack and he was the tallest one and he was booging down and his dance moves were so amazing <laughs> that I just had to look at him and go, wow, who is, who is this guy? So he has a singing voice and maybe if he's inspired to sing us a song, um, he'll do that. I remember hearing him sing a, a karaoke song after a rugby match. <laughs> but more on that later. Enough for me. Uh, folks, I would like to introduce to you a very good friend from way back, uh, Mr. Apollo Perellini. Hey, brother, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> what an introduction. Me as a dancer. Oh, I, I think it was your, um, your mate Uffy's moves that I was, uh, I was uh, sort of, I had stolen from years back, but. Uh, <laughs> Ah, the singing voices, uh, that, those are only when, you, uh, when you're having fun with all your mates. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to whatever comes out of this uh, talk story session. Um, <laughs> please, if you could share a little bit about uh, your background, and if you could go on and talk about uh, that moment when you first started playing the sport that you chose, and where did that take you? And how far did that take you? Yeah, the, I think the, the journey started way back. But I mean, I'm, I'm one of eight kids. Um, I'm the youngest of the baby of the family, as we call it. Um, youngest of eight kids and uh, born in Samoa. And we moved to New Zealand at a very, very young age. And, and I was you know, very young, hadn't started primary school then. Um, and then uh, lived in West Auckland in, in New Zealand and then... Uh, Attended uh, a custom primary, uh, which is a small primary school, uh, neighborhood primary school, which I'm uh, where I met a lot of the mates that that, that you are acquainted with, and uh, we started playing rugby. And, and to be honest, the only the only reason why I played rugby was to be with friends. And if my friends had played rugby league, which was it's interesting when, when I often people have asked me, you know, in the past, well, why didn't you play rugby league when you were younger um, as opposed to rugby union? And, and I said, because I lived almost, um, I probably just lived a mile too far in order to be a rugby league player. Um, if I, I lived a, a mile closer to the to rugby league club, I probably would have been a rugby league player. But um, I ended up sort of gravitating towards rugby union, and with all my mates playing rugby union, I um, that's how I started at the age of seven, and um, started playing at seven, bare feet. Then those days, no boots, no boots, <laughs> bare feet. We all used to love what, what running around in the mud and bare feet. You yeah. just love it. the slush of the mud, go through your, your toes in between your toes. So uh, <laughs> growing up back then, you know. And anyway, as Pacific Islanders, you couldn't afford boots. <laughs> that's that's yeah. right. I mean, I had the same thing uh, when I first got to New Zealand. No boots, bare feet, psh, go for it. Uh, and, but the it. side stepping, how did you start side step without uh, sprigs? Oh, mate, your toes, mate. Your toes. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> remember, we we got toes that grip, that grip the ground, and, and we we size them like that. <laughs> and, yeah, so um, yeah, we, we I mean, growing up in, in New Zealand was amazing. And we, we used to love it, and, and the funny thing when we were growing up, 
you know, when you think about sports nowadays where it's, it's, child, it's a child wanting to play sports and the parents supporting that child that in order for them to achieve whatever they want to achieve in, in life. I mean, especially at that young age, playing sports at grassroots level. We never had the support. Our parents didn't care. Where, where are you? Where are you going? I'm going to play rugby. Okay, make sure you do the chores first, you know, and whether it be, you know, mowing the lawns or cleaning the house or go outside, clean the garage. You had to do your work before, you know, your chores before you even went to rugby. It didn't matter. Um, rugby was a non-priority for our, for our, for our uh, culture, for, for our families, for our parents at that time. And mum and dad didn't really care so much for the sport because to them it was a distraction. It was a distraction to education. It was a distraction to... Um, to earn your money and eventually, you know, uh, get a job. So, um, dad, mum and dad really didn't really like me playing sports or playing rugby because um, it was time away from doing what I, you know, what I needed to do around the house, needed to do for the family. Because um, as a Pacific Island kid, you know, you you had a lot of responsibilities. It didn't matter how old you were, and you know, with a Tongan, Fiji, and Samoan. You had to, you know, hey, where you going? Nah, you know, you get the old slap in the head, get back in there. You know, <laughs> and if you come in late from training, mate, you, you come in and you go, oh, there's no food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they go, well, that's what happens when you go out and uh, play rugby. Hey, you come home, there's no food. <laughs> so, um, so from culturally, you know, it was challenging for us as kids, but we loved it. You know, we played for love. We played because we enjoyed it. We played it because your mates are there. And those same values and the same enjoyment is still there. Mm -hmm. It's just that the parents have changed. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and I think if you think about nowadays, the, the nature of the sport, kids play sports because they love it. Kids play sports because they're friends. Kids play sports because of enjoyment and, and um, that camaraderie and that friendship. But parents want them to play because they want to be the next All Black. Because <laughs> they want their child to be the next highlight. They want their child to sign the next contract. You know, um, it's all parent driven now. Whereas in our days, we just played for love. And we just, it, it was just enjoyment, you know. And, um, and I remember, you know, my neighbors who, um, and my Balangi friends, when I mean by Balangi friends, my European white friends. Their parents used to take us to the games. <laughs> yeah, all of us. Eh? I mean, you know, they, um, you know, the parents used to come and pick us up, you know, and they used to feel sorry for us because we, we just didn't have lifts. We had to walk everywhere. We had to walk to training. We walked to wherever the game was or catch a bus or, or get a lift. And, um, and you know, the European white, white kids and their parents would come and pick us up and, and take us to games. And even sometimes they'll they'll have a have some sandwiches already made for us. <laughs> and I was like, you know, man, they love us. <laughs> but um, but yeah, and, and that was rugby and sports growing up in New Zealand. And then um, and then I just then the journey kind of took me to you know high school. And I think it wasn't only in high school that I started to get serious about rugby. Rugby then became sort of oh, ashy. At the age of 16, I realized, oh, actually, I'm not too bad at this. So um, it started getting serious. So, uh, you know, then you started to make rep representative teams, playing you know, provincials and then uh, eventually playing, you know, national level. But it still was because of the enjoyment. And, um, and that's kind of my journey in the game up to high school. I have a... Uh a story a memory <laughs> um, you can expand on it a little bit uh, but I think um, what you've just said is clearly one's focus on the game or focus on the job or regardless what it is so folks a few weeks ago um, through um, a chit chat and then uh, Apollo here shared a moment where the group of boys uh, went out but 
this guy here was so dedicated that the next day he had a game that he uh, had to go to. Could you um could you expand on that on because you know how it is what you've just talked about it ah, we do it because we love it and we're having fun but there's also that one part of your brain is telling you you know what I'm done now I got to do this can you share that moments where you had so much fun but then the next day you had a big 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 responsibility. Oh, there's, uh, I mean, in high school, right? And, and, and I mean, in high school, right? And I still remember, um, you know, with, with you guys and, and a few no, other boys, we will always be out sort of going, you know, it, when you're a teenager, when you're, you know, 16, 17, lots are going on, you know. And sometimes you, you feel like you miss out because of your commitments on a Saturday. Mm. And on a Friday night is the busiest night of, uh, you know, any teenager's calendar, you know, weekly calendar. But on a Friday night, that's when us sort of rugby players should be tucked up in bed and, you know, pre preparing for first 15 rugby um, the following morning. So, but I always used to go out with my friends, go, you know, to just go socials, go some places. There was one night we went to... Um, we caught a bus. We caught all the way to Mangri, to a place called uh, uh, Tapuai College, and there was a dance there. It was, and um, it, was, it was, I think it's about ten miles, and more than that. And it was, it was a bit of a trek. We caught a bus there, and then at the end of the night, around about twelve o'clock, we realised we had missed the last bus, and there was about there was about ten of us, and we had to walk. Yeah, you missed the bus, brother. <laughs> the <laughs> bus is finished. Baba. Yeah. Absolutely, it's gone. And so we had to walk four and a half to close to five hours home. Wow. And, you know, on the way home, you know, we were just walking and I'd be like, going, I'm so naked, so tired. You know, and I had a, and I was captain. I was captain of Fisher Dean and, and I had a game the following day. And, um, you know, and it's funny because people just go, how do you do it? And, and so, you know, we would walk all the way home, I'll get home and I'll get to bed around about six o'clock in the morning and my legs are so tired I've been walking for four and a half, five hours. And then um, at 12 o'clock I was at six hours sleep and then 12 o'clock I had to go to the school, get ready and had a game, you know. But, um, and I think mentally you... Um, you know, at a very young age, I think mentally, I, I kind of grew that sort of mental toughness to just to get through it. Mate. And um, we ended up playing a really awesome game that day. <laughs> I had my warm up that <laughs> early oh, you on. You had a good game, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I still remember what, what I did get was, was uh, I had some blisters because. Um, Remember my shoes that I walked in with dance shoes, you know, like uh, hard. It was hard soul sort of like uh, school shoes. So um, I had I had a couple of blisters, and I still remember that because um, when I got home, I kind of just took off my shoes, and and um, there was blood on on my socks, and um, um, yeah, it was back in those days when we, we used to wear um, black shoes and and white socks, you know, a bit like Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> White socks, black shoes, and uh, and baggies. Um, so my my white socks had blood all over the back of the heel, and, and, wow. and I this is a, a really really painful. So I had to play, you know, a, a whole game with the blisters. It was so funny, and I'm just, it's funny you reminded me of that story. You know? it was just so it was, <laughs> you brought up that story, and I when I heard when you mentioned that story, I went, what? Good on you, bro. Because you, th that stuck with me because in thinking about motivation, yes, other people can motivate you, but it comes back to yourself, right? If you don't take that step forward, well, nothing's going to happen. I mean, to me, that was an inspirational story. Uh, well, a, a fun sort of story. Um, <laughs> could, you ex could you sort of think back um, during your high school days, was there a moment that, that, that you clicked that, you know, look, Apollo, I'm talking to yourself, <laughs> Apollo, 
I gotta slow down on this thing here. I'm starting to improve in this field. Where was the separation for you? I know uh, folks, this guy here, um, well, from my memory there, I don't think there was a lot of separation because he was still tight with his group, but he took up that level, you know? So where was that moment when you had to find that balance and then kind of shift it? Yeah, well, it's funny, you, you, interesting, that, that, that's a great, um, because we, people, and, and, and I often sort of, and I've spoken about this with, with a lot of my friends, is that I used to go out drinking with my mates during the week, <laughs> with my good <laughs> friends. And, and you got to remember these guys I've been friends with from primary school, and, and um, they're close to me, you know, the, um, you know, um, those, that Calston area, that, that, that neighbourhood, we were tight and, and we had, um, we would go drinking during the day, during, during the, in the evenings, during the week, but I still put on my boots and go training. I still put on my boots and go and play in the weekends when they weren't doing anything, you know? And so, um, but it's, you know, um, that turning point and, and, and it's a good friend of mine and you know him very, very well. And, uh, and he said to me, and it was one day we were drinking in a, in a, in a pub and I think I was about uh, 18, going on to 19 and we we're drinking in the pub and, and he said to me, what am I doing there? And I said, why? And he says, well, it's okay for him to be there because he's got no future in what I do. He said, but you've got an opportunity. And, and he said to me, you've got an opportunity. And, and that's Michael, Michael Manukia. And, uh, and, uh, and he'll, he'll vouch for that. If you ever speak to him, he'll vouch for that. And he said to me, you shouldn't be here. I don't want you to be here. And he actually said to me, I really don't want you to be here drinking with me because this is not where you should be. You know, you should go and chase your dreams. You know, and kind of from there, I kind of then realized, yeah, yeah, I guess so. But back then, rugby wasn't um, professional. It was, it was still amateur. Um, you weren't getting paid for it. But I had an opportunity to, to do well in it. That's all it was. It's was just opportunity to do well in that sport, to represent your your um, your country, represent uh, your um, your city, your province, and so that that's what sort of really uh, drove me to to go for it and and um, and give up my mates, you know. And, and then so when we all left school, we kind of. We all just went our own separate ways, and and um, we never, we 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 do now. We're we're now closer than that than we ever been. <laughs> it's well, funny, uh, yeah. We're Social all over media, the world. Yeah, absolutely. We're all over the world, and we're closer now than, than we've ever been. And so, um, you know, as we're really blessed to have friends like that. That you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been away for. You know, 20, 30 years we've been separated. Over 30 years we've been separated and a couple of years ago we got together to play golf for the first time. Um, the whole group of us. And it was like we never left. It's like we never... It's like we were at school again, you know, just this, the same old jokes, the same personalities, the same, you know, the same gestures. Everything was still the same, you know. And, and we, we would just laugh about just how... Where, you know, how life has taken us in all in different paths, but we're still doing okay for ourselves. You know? yep. We're still, um, but we, the, the greatest thing about that is, is that even though 30 years apart, we've not seen each other. When we come together, we're still, uh, we still value each other. You know, we still respect, we still value, and we still, we still have that love for each other. That's the great thing, you know, it's, it's a, you, you can't change that, you know, and, and true friendship, it's not uh, based on time, you know. It's, it's based on you know your, your relationship will always be the same. It's unconditional. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that, those are yeah, some 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 great stories. But yeah, that was one of the turning points that you know, he told me that I didn't need to be in that bar with him. <laughs> so. 
Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> some wise words from wise from words, Michael. Yeah, man. Michael. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. hey, look, um, friendship uh, in our own personal life, but friendship as uh, in our professional life, you're quite right. You cannot, uh, what's the word? Uh, you cannot, um, you cannot let go of that, right? Because that's their foundation, all right? And to mm. hear you share this story by Michael, but see, that's, that's just a beautiful, beautiful moment there. How important, um, I know if you shared it, but I just want to ask you this question quickly. How important was it for you to have that solid, solid group of friends, their foundation in the, back in the school days? Yeah. Oh, it's very important. I think that's, that's um, we, 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 we <laughs> a lot of stories and, and behind that group of friends. And there was... <laughs> You can write a book about those, the, my days with those boys, you know, bus stops, train tracks, you name it. We were, we, we did some, some crazy things, but, but, you know, it's those crazy things, those lessons in life that, that, that you learn from that, that makes you the person that you are. You know, I wouldn't be the person that I am if I hadn't gone through those experiences. Those, yeah. uh, those, those times where, you know, you're, your misbehaving days. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. Look, I don't. Yeah, I think um, regret is such a horrible word, and I don't don't use regret. I, I sort of like, I just think they're learning moments, you know. And I look back and I reflect on those learning moments uh, um, with those with those boys, and we did a lot of a lot of good things together, but we also did a lot of bad things together. Um, that. When we look back, we think, how dumb were we? We were just typical teenagers <laughs> being dumb. And so, um, but that's, but that's, a, but that's, a, um, that's everybody's journey. That's everybody's journey. We all, we all go through the same things. We all go through those same experiences of doing dumb things. We just did them. They were quite outrageous. <laughs> we were, we were well, I can't share them. What they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, let's not share them. I locked them up and I thrown away the key, never to be, never to be unleashed again. <laughs> Unless I make a movie out of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's coming up next. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> so we, well, when I met you guys, it, it was it was a wonderful experience, and I got actually I'm glad, um, glad because um, I went to a different high school. And I'm going to talk about the high school in a little bit. <laughs> uh, but knowing you guys through, I think uh, maybe you through Mohenoa and 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 Maki, um, yeah, you know, just other guys. But when I met you guys, I just thought, wow, this is such a a crazy bunch of boys. And you guys actually taught me something because I was a new kid in the block, and and then with my brother as well. And I love those those late night ish stories, which we, which we won't get into those bus stories, those <laughs> hanging out all over the place. But I think um, just knowing you and the group that tight knit, um, that tight knit unity is a great foundation. And that's, that was just wonderful to hear. Another point I want to bring up is relate, uh, sorry, it's relationship, which I mentioned before. Can you talk about your relationship with your rugby coach in high school? Because, brother, when I um, when I found out that you were already playing rep rugby during high school, I, you know, it, it kind of blew my mind. I said, "What is that? You were already moving up the ladder, but there was somebody in your high school that coach that you guys were also tight knit, knit with. Uh, we were tight with." Could you share your thoughts on how Coach Henry uh, helped you to move along and, with, and also with the other boys that um, played rugby? Yeah, um, yeah, Graham Henry was, was yeah, not only was he a, a coach, he was, a, he was my headmaster, he was our headmaster at the time. <laughs> and, um, and you know, it's so important to have a relationship with your coach. And when I mean by relationship, and, and it's, it's funny, interesting you brought up the word relationship. Because um, in order to get the best out of a player, you got to have that relationship with the coach, and and often and often we leave the game because of coaching. 
you know, because of a coach. And it was, it was someone like Graham that really sort of spoke into my life that I can actually make it, that you could do well in it. And, you know, I hear that belief. There were other coaches there that really inspired me. But I think Graham, you know, Graham Henry was the, the coach kind of that drove you to be the best you can possibly be. And um, it's having that coach that believes in you that, that, that says, do you know what, you probably haven't hit your straps right now, but you will do when you do. Yeah, I think you'll do well at this game. And um, and yeah, and, and Graham was was very supportive. And you're right, we did have that relationship. We had, we had that real player coach. I had a teacher uh, student coach with, um, relationship with him, but I also had a um, um, player coach relationship with him. Now I have a good friendship uh, relationship with him. You know, he came over to visit um, uh, to do some stuff here in Dubai, and we went out for dinner, had some had a barbecue together. Um, you know, and talk about the old days and he couldn't believe what I'm doing now. You know, he's like, oh, gee, I thought you were going to be someone that's just going to be swept up on the side of the, of the road. <laughs> but um, no, he was he was good. He was, he, again, you know, there are going to be people in your life that's going to speak uh, sort of positiveness and, and sort of inspiration into your life that's going to say, you know, you can do it, and um, you've just got to um, find those people. You know, you, people some, sometimes they're right in front of you, but you just mm-hmm. don't see it. Um, you know, and people people um, struggle with uh, building relationships with, with with coaches, just like people struggle to build relationships with their bosses at work. Oh, yeah. People leave work because not because of their work, not because of their job. They leave work because of their bosses, mm-hmm. and that's how. People leave clubs because of their coaches in, um, in the professional era, you know. So it's 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 it's, it's important to have that relationship with, with a coach or your 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 leader within your uh, your workplace. Yeah, that's that's so so true. And I'm gonna sort of push you along to talk about the, that moment when somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, "You know, hey, mate, you could go up to the next level." When did you leave the amateur status and get to that? Uh, yeah, just talk about that moment before you got to the professional level. When was that moment when somebody tapped you? Just the money. <laughs> right. Just before I got to talk, she chased the money. <laughs> Actually, um, look, I was, I was, um, and I remember back then, um, you know, playing for playing for Auckland sort of age groups and then building, climbing up the ladder and then then eventually sort of representing Samoa. You know, I played for New Zealand, New Zealand under 21s um, and that was the next rung of the ladder before you even hit the All Blacks. You know, you mm-hmm. kind of, okay, you've made the New Zealand age group under 21s, you know, your next step is now to try and make the All Blacks. But the... The, the problem is that you had so many good players in your position that you're kind of thinking you can be sitting on this conveyor belt for a while. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I actually left. So after going to the World Cup with Samoa and, and Samoa in 91, mm-hmm. I came back and then um, I decided to move from, um, and I guess it was playing for Samoa that really, um, really, drove me sort of to the next level. I played, playing for New Zealand under 21s and that was, was good. You know, don't get me wrong, it was great. But it still wasn't the senior stage. Right, right. Playing for representing Samoa at the World Cup in 91, you're, you were on the main stage of rugby, you know, and millions were watching you and your performance and um, and in that tournament, I got, you know, labelled the Terminator and, um, for Samoa. And, and it's just by accident that I tackled a few guys and put them in the hospital. But that was an accident. You know? it's, it's like being in that bus step where I get. <laughs> but as, um, and I won't go into that. <laughs> and anyway, so, yeah, uh, and so... 
coming back from that the um, that whole experience of playing um, internationally, you realise that actually the rest of the world now has noticed you, you know, and so I ended up playing for North Harbour, played for North Harbour, and then um, then I got the phone call. Well, well it's funny, interesting. The 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 year before, well, six months before, I got the phone call to go to UK. Uh, for an offer to go to play rugby league in the UK. Freshly, I got a phone call from uh, uh, NRL club and um, asking to to go to NRL. Well, it was the coach. Anyway, the, it was answered the phone and and I thought it was I thought it was one of the boys playing a joke. Uh, I'm like, uh, yeah, whatever. And it was Graham Lowe. And so the guy was calling was Graham Lowe, who was the coach of Manly Manly Sea Eagles at the time. And he was like going, oh, hello, Apollo, you know, just um, wondered if you got some time to talk and wanted to meet up. And I'm like, hey, who is this? It's very alone. So, yeah, whatever. You know? This whole thing, I thought somebody was uh, playing a practical joke. Um, it ended up being Graham. And so I ended up meeting him and and he offered me a, a, a place at, um, at Manly, you know, to, to switch over to play for Manly. That's um, awesome, brother. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah no one knows their story, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I ended up, so I turned it down because my mother had been sick, and I thought, no, nah, this was not, it was, the timing wasn't quite right for me. So I ended up just leaving it. And then six months later, I was signed in a contract um, to go to St. Helens in, um, in the UK. So, um, so that was the big, that was the big shift for me. And, and, um, to to actually, the dream was to get paid to play, you know. And I think at the time there was no there was no professional rugby, you know. We're getting perks, yeah. We're getting perks. You may get a car. You may get you know, um, a job out of what you're doing here in, in, in the amateur game, but but we weren't getting paid for it. So to to get paid to be offered a contract to go and and play rugby league. Full time as a professional, full time professional. That that changed everything. Oh, brother, that that story is very inspirational. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, hey, uh, I want to bring you back a few years before you before you flew away. Um, <clears throat> I believe this was the last time I saw you. We were in the same country, same rugby team. Before then, we we're in different schools and so forth. But the same rugby team for Messi Rugby Club. <laughs> and for me, there was the moment when I went, wow, this brother is, is going places. I could see it, but this was sort of that tangible um, evidence, so to speak, was when you presented the club, uh, see, a koi, koi shirt from, um, oh, oh boy, I'm in trouble now. Um, the Pacific Island team. Was that it? No, it was uh, World 15. Oh, the World 15. Okay, sorry. Yeah. And you were leaving the club. You were, That was the moment when you were um, going. Yeah. And um, and shortly after that, uh, I don't know, the team went out somewhere or a group of friends got together. And you remember uh, Ray? Yeah. Ray, he, um, at this, somebody's house, everybody was talking, talking, talking. And then Ray got up and said, hey, boys, boys, gather. And he made a speech. He said, this could be the last time we see each other. And I just thought, damn, this is kind of deep for a group of boys. <laughs> for me, that was a very clear moment that we were all going this way. And you, yep, you were going that way. How did you cope with that separation? And especially yeah, with your I, family as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the... Um... I mean, the, 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 the challenges was always going to be regardless, you know, with the, you know, you're leaving your friends or leaving your fr uh, family, you're, you're actually leaving the country. <laughs> and I've never lived anywhere else other than New Zealand. I mean, okay, I was born in Samoa, but to, to get up and leave New Zealand and to travel literally to the other side of the world, um, to a totally different culture, Totally different country. Um, 
and start a whole new life. The, it, I think it was a change of mindset that um, the, the mindset would kind of be, I always say that, that when I was playing rugby, that I was playing, that was my passion. Um, and the playing rugby league and moving abroad was my job. Mm. And there's a big difference, you know. Um, you know, it's um, it was it was literally <laughs> leaving to go to work. Okay, <laughs> got a new job opportunity elsewhere, you know. And, and 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 that's where I try and explain to people that people go, oh yeah, but you know, rugby's a person. I said, yeah. I mean, at the time when when I wasn't getting paid for it and I was playing for love, yeah, it was it was my passion. The moment you start getting paid for it, it becomes your job. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a vocation. It's something that that you train for. Your your um, everything you do on your daily basis is based on what you need to do to be good at your job. You know, you know, with the food, the food that you eat, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. work that you do, the stretches that you do outside of the rugby field. You know, that's all part and parcel of your job. And, um, and that's that's how I saw it. And, yeah, people go, oh yeah, because you went over there because of the experience and that. I said, yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, I mean, moving moving abroad wasn't easy. It was hard to leave, like you said, friends and family. It was hard to to leave the culture of um, you, like you put it before, the unity, um, the brotherhood, the brotherhood of having that, you know that support network around you. We didn't have a network when I went to, to the UK, although um, Inga, Inga Tungamala and Afi were already there. Her dad already made the move over there. But um, but at the time, you know, when I made the move, I kind of made the chain mind shift. I had to make the mind shift that, um, that it was going to be full time, something that I'm not used to. You know, um, and and I needed to make that 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 mind shift to say, this is now a job. I've now got to look at um, at putting everything into this job and committing to this job and and being the best as I can possibly be at this job. So um, so that was the, the change of mindset, and, and it was it was. Um, and I guess you know when people talk about professionalism, it's professionalism. Professionalism is not just a job and, and, and the thing that you're, it's the environment that you're in. It's the mindset that you take upon yourself. You know, being professional. It's the little things that you do, the little processes that you go through in order to be that person. Um, and and that's the mindset that I had to take on. And um, because I was getting paid to do it. <laughs> so true. So true. Hey, just touching on that during your time, and also mentioned Afi and Apollo. Um, sorry, and Inga, did you guys have a, um, oh, what do they call it, um, uh, a professional uh, person that helped you along the way? Uh, what do they call it? Agent. Um, uh, sorry? Agent. An agent. agent. No, not an agent. Um, de- dealing with, 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 with your, uh, see, what is that thing? Um, psychology, a psychiatrist. You know, to help you, this profession is that the right word to help you along the way? Because you have to change your mindset. Did you guys have something to help you regarding your? No, no, it wasn't. The I think a lot of it, and at the time, I think it was more. Um, we had to rely on on our um, our, our spiritual upbringing um, of church, yeah. and and I think that's where people don't you know don't, you know got to remember that. Um, and my parents always said to me, "Listen." Doesn't matter where you go in this world, what you do, don't forget to pray. <laughs> don't forget God. God will always be with you, and that's our culture. And our culture is grounded on the on our faith, on the faith in God. And so, um, so I didn't need a psych- psychologist in order to change my mindset. Um, you know, um, we, you know, we, Elf, the. Our belief system, our, our, our growth internally and mentally and uh, spiritually comes off the back of our faith and believing that 
you know, God is with us, our prayer time, our um, fellowship with, with other, um, you know, people who have the same faith. And right. so that's, that's what keeps you supported and, and keeps you strong, you know, and um, so that it doesn't matter where you go and, you know, um, anywhere in the world, you know, you, you didn't need that psychological support that people seek for nowadays. You know, there's a lot of people now, you know, where it's mindfulness, you know, they look for, they look for that, that spiritual sort of, uh, they seek spiritual sort of awareness or seek spiritual support when God's never left us. He's never, he's always there, you know, and, and he won't come in unless you ask him to. So, um, so we, that's, that's how we, we, we were able to cope. And it was the same with Inga. And it was the same with all the majority of us uh, Pacific Islanders. It's, it's just uh, falling back on into our faith. So true. Again, that's touching on foundation, right? They're having that foundation there. Without that, things could be could be difficult. And I'm glad that you mentioned your parents because, yep, in the Pacific Island culture or life, that foundation is from our parents, okay? And without that, yep. We can get a we, we take for granted our parents and well we, I mean look don't get me wrong not take for granted that they did a lot for us but what we take for granted is is the the journey that they did they took yeah. in order to put us where we are now you know you know I think about my parents who got up and left everything they knew in Samoa with eight kids <laughs> who, who does that just pack up uh, where you go uh, Auckland why uh, we've got family there, but we're gonna we're gonna pack up and leave everything we know and leave Samoa. And it's the same with Tongans, you know, leaving Tonga to start a new life, you know. So you've got to give it to our parents for having the audacity and just the just the guts and, and real sort of um, what's the word for? But just having the the real, you know. Um, just the guests to do it, you know, and just to do it. I, I often just wonder and marvel at the, what they did. You know, they got up with kids. It's different with myself. When when I left UK, uh, New Zealand, I left just the two of us. It was just me and, and at the time my fiance, and then we ended up getting married. But it was just the two of us. So, you know, it was, it was all right. I didn't have eight kids to drag with me to the other side of the world to start a whole new life. And so. Uh, so, you know, we're, we've got a lot to be thankful for, you know, when we think about our parents. That's, that's so true because um, it was different from their time, right? But it's still the same thing. Um, I mean, who are we to say, oh, they didn't matter, but oh boy, they mattered a lot. Um, mm. You left uh, Auckland, a big move, a big move. Did you say goodbye to your mom and dad? <laughs> yeah. I have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> when you say goodbye to mom there, you have to say goodbye to them physically, man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you yeah, remember that, you know, it's funny back in those days, there was no WhatsApp messages, there was no Facebook, there was no nothing. It was a collect call, eh? It was always a collect call. You know, and I get to you're the same in moving to Hawaii. You know, it was always a, yes, are you able to take this collect call from New Zealand? Yeah, all right. <laughs> and you always get in trouble if you didn't call them. <laughs> yep, you make sure you call your parents. Yeah. <laughs> so, mate, um, I love these, uh, uh, sharing these stories about our family and friends. Um, they, they help build their foundation, as, as I mentioned. Jumping ahead. Your experience leaving Auckland, the new country, different climate. What was your first impression? When you, when you think of uh, England, you kind of think of Coronation Street, which is a, it's an, it's an old sort of brick, <laughs> brick houses, ew, 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 ew. yeah, cobblestone roads and everything. Well, it was that. It was exactly that. So it was like it wasn't like. Um, actually, it's exactly how I envisaged it would be. You know, it was exactly the same. So, um, 
making that move um, to the UK was 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 a was a culture shock. Very 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 much a culture shock. No islanders to be seen anywhere. You know, you say you used to yeah, you go down down the road. You know, there's always an islander. You know, and so um, you know, I was the only at the time. I was the only islander in the, in that whole town. You know, it was uh, it was weird, but you were accepted. You know, and, and that's a great thing about. Look, the UK is so diverse, you know, there's so many cultures and, and that, but you get accepted and, 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 and just as normal, you know, and, and that's the great thing about you know, other countries. I think, um, you know, no one ever frowns at you for being different. Everybody looks at you as being different, but yet same, you know, <laughs> whereas uh, and, and I sometimes, you know, get challenged and, and when I go back home to New Zealand, I feel challenged sometimes because you, you still get looked at as an islander. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> still get looked at as an islander. You're still an islander. You know? yeah. but, and after living away from, from New Zealand and going to living in the UK for so long and now living um, in Dubai, you're a person irrespective of where you live, uh, where you grew up and what colour your skin. You know, you're a... Uh, um, you know, colors, people of our skin color are of high standing here. You know, <laughs> you know, you know um, people look at you equally, you know, and, 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 and it's quite good. So the move to the UK, it was just the weather that, that challenged me because it was freezing. When I moved over there, it was absolutely, I was like going, what the world? What have I? What have I done here? And anyway, so I, I got used to it and, and um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Saw snow for the first time, you know, wow. an island and snow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. It was awesome. You know, it's great when when it started to snow and you're out there running around in the snow, you know, and um, just experiencing the actual different uh, seasons. Mm-hmm. You actually got, you actually saw autumn, you actually saw spring, and you actually saw winter. <laughs> hey, Summer came and gone in one day. <laughs> hey, look, you're a tough guy. You're a tough guy. You can handle it. Handle it. <laughs> Mate, um, did the team throw you into the fire and said, okay, AP, you're here. You're professional. Go for it. And when did, um, when did, when did it hit you? I'm a professional. Uh, rugby league player now. Was it before you left Auckland, New Zealand, or was it when you got to the UK? Uh, not until I got to the UK, not until I started playing and getting paid. <laughs> 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 maybe, you got, maybe you got paid for you, but uh, uh, now you're yeah. a professional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, <clears throat> one of the, um, the great thing about the game of rugby league and, and going back to the start of my story, you know, start of my journey that if I had lived half an hour, I mean, sorry, a mile up the road, I probably would have been a rugby league player because that's the rugby league area of where I lived. Um, club called Glen Roar down in Glen, Glen mm-hmm. Eden. Um, and a lot of my mates from school all played rugby league, you know, and you know, so, but to, to go to the UK to play rugby league, which is a totally different sport again, although it's, it's kind of similar. Um, I was thrown in the deep end. Training was a lot harder. The game was a lot harder. I found out that I had to, um, that I was praying a lot more in training just to get through training. <laughs> oh, God, help me get through this training. <laughs> it was so hard. <laughs> it was... It was training every day, man. And a lot of that, a lot of the training, I'll come back home and I just go to sleep. I was just so tired, you know. It was just because wow. you were a professional. That's your job, you know. And, and they required you to be as you know fitter than fitter, <laughs> fitter than you've ever been. Never been. And, um, but if I was to look back in my career playing rugby union, playing rugby league, um, I would say that I was. I was passionate about the game of rugby union, mm. but I was more suited to the game of rugby league. I was a rugby league player playing rugby union all my life. Can Can you expand on that? Um, and maybe Maybe I could share a little story about. Um, you could correct me if I'm wrong or not. 
Okay, so I'm going to touch on the um, Calston and um, Henderson High School first 15 games. Yeah, we lost, <laughs> but I rem dis distinctly remember you running through our forward pack and you scored a beautiful try. You have that build, as you're saying, uh, to play rugby league. I, I wish you hadn't run through our pack, but you did. So could you expand on... Um, what you mean by that? You were more of a rugby league, but you played union. I think the the game, you know, I'm more of a runner with the ball. Yeah, ball in you, hand. You know. Well, that's what you did. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Pacific Islanders are really sort of clear cut rugby league players. You know, you, that they really suited suited with the ball in hand. You know, um, they love they love to express themselves with with the ball in hand, but. But also they express themselves in, in defense, you know. And and I used to love defending, you know? and I think that the challenges that I used to put myself under, you know, I used to give myself in, de in, in defense, you know, uh, how many hard hits I could put in this in this game, you know. And um, it was never afraid of tackling, never afraid of not having the ball and and going out and trying to um, defend your line. I think that was. You know, some people are, are afraid of, of tackling and some people are not not gifted tacklers, you know. And whereas I think myself growing up, you know, I I revel at the defence. You know, I loved it. In a moment, moment the ball would, moment we didn't have the ball, it was a challenge like, let's go get that ball back or let's yeah. go and, and challenge the person who's running the ball, you know, and, and you know, hit them as hard as you can. Um, and I'm sure if, if, if I'd lived, if I grew up in, in the UK, uh, sorry, in, in, in the US, if I was a Samoan boy growing up in Hawaii or the US, I probably would have played NFL. You know, I probably, you know, you know, probably would have been a running back. You know, and that's that's what suits us. You know, and you know, exactly. uh, um, so. Those, you know, or linebacker, you know, yeah. go in and try and sack, <laughs> sack anybody you want. So hey, hold, hold, hold the yeah. press, hold the press, hold the press. Is this you announcing that you're looking yeah. for an NFL contract to follow? <laughs> <laughs> the Terminator is after another contract. Yeah. Well, you can see that, that that's where those are the positions that we're best suited because we're, we're one big people, but we're also very quick. We're agile for, for our size. And, and we're, we're not afraid to hit, you know, we're not afraid to, for, for the contact area. Sorry, we're not afraid of the collisions. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I think about my, my days in, in rugby union, you know, as a loose forward, I was always arriving at breakdowns, securing ball. Probably I'll come away from, a, from the game, probably carrying the ball three or four times in a game and probably making... Um, a high tackle count of 15 tackles in, in a rugby union game. Um, in rugby league, you know, I was probably averaging 35, 35 tackles in a game and probably 15 to 20 hit-ups, you know, you know, carries. If I wanted to carry the ball, I'd go looking for it. <laughs> Just give me the ball, <laughs> you know, ask for it. <laughs> so um, so in, in, in a way, sort of, I was much suited to the game of rugby league than I was in rugby union. Although I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed both. Yep. And, and I got to see that. And I got to see that. Hey, mate, can <laughs> you talk about, um, though it was tough for you, what kept you going? What motivated you to continue with this? Because you're right. You, you could have just stopped and left, but you stayed. Where did the uh, motivation come from to keep going? Uh, look, the motivation came because, um, again, you, you kind of think about, the journey that your parents did, you know, they they never gave up on going to New Zealand and starting a new life and working two jobs and working hard. You know, that that, that was their motivation, was to put food on the table. It's the same with us. It's the same with us at the moment. You know? It's the same for me at the moment right now. You know, what's my motivation? <laughs> to put food on the table, to... Um, to to give, um, to provide, to um, to grow, and and look, 
and, and, and the thing is, for me personally, is that if I'm not contributing and, and I'm not uh, learning and I'm not growing at all, then, you know, then I'm standing still. So um, my, the motivation is always about trying to be in a position to contribute, whether it's to family or friends or to to people, you know, to, you know, and that always to be in that position, you know. Um, it's funny because living here in Dubai, you see a lot of poverty. Uh, well, not poverty in that there's no, no beggars anywhere because you're only here to work. Everybody that's here in Dubai works. But when somebody washes my car and I've got to pay them, you know, I tip them because I know that whatever they get paid, you know, is, is minuscule. So you tip them to make sure that they, you know, get that extra um, money in their pockets. So you're contributing. So the things that you do, just the little things you do. Plus also, you know, um, you know, we, we're wanting, we, we still maintain the support, uh, our support to our families, you know, um, our extended families, you know, and culturally we're still, um, we feel still obligated as part of our culture and um, that it's important that what is our motivation is that making sure that, you know, that if anything was to happen to any of our families, that we have the means to support, you know, sure. and, uh, and I think sometimes we, we, we put ourselves in a, in a space where, oh, um, as long as we are okay, then that's okay. Yeah. And I, and I uh, sort of, and I don't agree with that. And I think, um, that's a selfish motivation, you know, selfish motivation. It's kind of, um, it's all about you and um, it's, it's all about self. It is, and, it, it, and I think the intrinsic motivation that has, that gets me going is, is that I want to be in a position to support. And I want to be in a position to, to say um, to my kids, um, you know, as they're making their journey, the same as we are, and back in New Zealand, um, you know, you need to, you need my help, you know, um, you know, and I'm here. So that's my motivation. It always has been um, to be in a better position to to support others. Hey, I couldn't agree with you more on that, and that's so true. And I think there's you're also touching on our upbringing, from the mm-hmm. tight Pacific Island um, uh, upbringing, brother. You've done so well, and you're in Dubai uh, now, but I want to continue with the UK story. Throughout your career, when did you feel like it was time to call it quits and move on to the next stage? Um, because you, you represented uh, Samoa. That's a massive, massive achievement. But you also left Auckland, your home at the time. Um, when did you think, okay, I think I'm done? <laughs> yeah. And the next stage? Yeah, the next part of the, the next part of the book was chapter two. <laughs> yeah, um, where, um, when, when I so I, I finished from playing rugby league, and I um, in 2000 I signed uh, a contract to go back to rugby union and uh, play for a team called Sale in Manchester, UK, which is only uh, 45 minutes away from where I, I lived anyway. So I decided to go back to Rugby Union and um, and I was there for about, I was contracted for three years, but I only played two. Um, and on that second year, I kind of lost all motivation you know, and, and the challenges it got. You know, I, I represented my country in both Rugby League and Rugby Union World Cups. I played, now. I think I was the first first player to play um, for Samoa in Rugby League. Yeah. yeah, Rugby League World Cup and Rugby Union World Cup, you know. So, um, and also, you know, the the motivation to, to keep going um, kind of had dropped off, you know. I, I got sick and tired of putting my boots on. I got sick and tired of, um, you know, going out there and, and getting hit and making hits. You know, you mm-hmm. got to. I drew a line on that, and, and it was one day I was just driving, and I realised, you know what, I'm tired. I'm done. 
I kind of done. I, I just made a decision. Wow. Look, no one made a decision for me. I made a decision for myself. And you often see a lot of players still holding on to that dream of, you know, they're still prolonging their rugby career. They're still trying to play. They're still looking for the next contract. They're still seeking the next contract from one contract. And, and, and they hit this peak. And then they go for the next contract is the next club down. And then next contract is the next division down. And, and before you know it, you're playing, you're playing against people that are of no significance to your stature from where you were playing. Mm-hmm. And you've gone from playing this, being this big name to all of a sudden playing in third division, just trying to hold on to that rugby career. Uh-huh. <laughs> all that sporting career. It doesn't matter what sport you're in. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't, that wasn't me. I, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna bow out, I'll bow out at the top. You know, if I'm gonna retire and I'm finished at the top and you know and say I'm done. And so, but I've always wanted I was always good at mentoring young players. I was always school, so good at coaching. And okay. so I decided that I wanted to be a coach. So um I automatically sort of went into the coaching role and um, and went into coaching as soon as I retired, and then um, I went back to coaching in um, in rugby league, mm-hmm. and that's where my rugby league journey, um, our coaching journey started. Yeah, so that was a change. That was the change. You play at the highest level with people who also play at the highest level. Were there lots of lows during that period? Because it just sounds like that you kept going, kept going, and then you finished at the top. Could, could you share your thoughts on some of the lows and how did you bring yourself out, out of that? Yeah, the, look, there was, I mean, there was probably a lot more highs than lows. I think the lows are always based around injuries okay. and, um, and your, your mental ability to get over them. And the, my lows were always um, around family losses. You know, my mother passed away when I was still in the, still in the UK. Um, you know, and I had to fly back knowing that she had passed away while I was um, while I was in the air flying back. Um, also, the um, those are pretty low times, but also it was it was a it was a time that drove me to be better, mm. you know, because you always wanted me to be better. And um, but the lows for me was always during my in- times of injuries, you know, because when you're injured. It's a lonely place, injuries, <laughs> and um, when you get injured, and um, the recovery time is a long time. Your rehab time is a lonely time, and um, and then then on the back of that, you lose form, mm-hmm. and then you struggle with form. And mentally, it's um, you kind of struggle with it because you're um, it's it's a tough time to try and adjust to. Um, that you you're not the player that you used to be. Um, now, when you talk about lows, also there was a time um, when I finished playing. You know, so to get over that, you know, it was more just um, I had to put it into perspective. When I was playing, I had to look at my kids. You know, my kids I had a young family, and so your main focus was that what drove you to go to training to train harder. To, to come back um, was the people around you. Um, you stop doing it for yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's where um, I don't, you know, I think some people say, oh, you got to dig deep within yourself, you know, uh, you got to do it for yourself. Yeah, I've been doing it for myself for a long time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was also doing it for, um, uh, yeah, that's intrinsically motivated. But a lot of it, you know, later on in life when you get a little bit older and mature, Mm -hmm. that you start doing it for people that you care for. And, you know, and my motivation with my kids and my wife and my family. And so um, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how bad a game you play and how bad a form that you're in. When you go home and your son says, love you, Dad, are you okay? What am I worried about? What am I worried about? Yeah. What on earth am I so stressed and so 
concerned about. It's got nothing to do with life. You know, it's just a game. At the end of the day, I'm just an entertainer. I'm part of the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. I go onto a rugby field to be watched by people who pay to come and watch me play. That's all I am. And that's my job. So when I'm losing, when I'm busy worried about my form and busy worried about, um, you know, the um, how I'm doing, I only need to look at my kids to, to get me motivated to say, you know what, that's not life. That's life there. And so um, we, you know, with people, when, you, when we're talking about, you know, um, you know, finding something, you've got to find something to really care about. You know, find something that, that you really care about and that you want to do well for. And, and I think um, when people start, when people dig deep, they realise that, you know, doing it for yourself really doesn't really work sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when you're doing it for people, you know, when, you, with, um, when, you, when, there's, when you're doing it for a purpose, you, know, you, you find something. That extra bit, you know, and um, and that's that's where I, I I find my motivation to to drive my my drive, my motivation, my you know the is is for what I can do for people and you know and the people around you. Mate, this is this is very inspiring. Just listening to you uh, talk <laughs> about that journey. Um, to be honest, uh, yeah, I know. Yes, I've not seen you since ages, but. To hear you talk about quitting league at that level and then finding this other journey and how you talk or how you speak, yeah, you make a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good coach. You're out there motivating the next generation. What is the most satisfying thing about coaching for you? What is the most satisfying? I want somebody's learning. It's somebody's learning. Man, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's not about the wins and it's not about, it's not, yeah, yeah. It's people, people often think, oh, you, you're coaching for them for, to perform. I said, no, nah, you're coaching for them to enjoy, enjoy the coaching, uh, to enjoy the journey. Um, I'm only part of that journey. Um, you know, I always say to players that I've coached and they said, listen, I'll, I'm probably just one part of that journey of so many parts and 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 I hope that I can instill some development in your in your journey that will help you eventually get that 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 final goal. And we are just parts, you know, we are, you know, and you know, I look back and you know we talk about Graham Henry before and I said he was only one part of my journey. Yeah. You know, and since you know and before that I probably had about five or six coaches before him. And then after that, I probably had another 10 to 20 coaches after him, you know. So so each coach is, plays a, a, such an important role in, in just putting, instilling some value, some disciplines, um, some skills, some um, fundamentals. So they are, every, every coach contributes to your journey, but whether good or bad, <laughs> you know, you have some good coaches and you have some bad coaches, but you learn from the bad coaches as well. So, and, so uh, true. And, that, and that's the thing. But the but if I look back and in, um, in, I mean, right now, in my coaching journey at the moment is all about inspiring kids. You know, and I think I posted on my um, my uh, uh, my social media just the other day that. I've coached professionally, I've coached internationally, but nothing gives me more enjoyment than coaching kids who are just loving and embracing the game. I, I was coaching, it was a video of me coaching kids who are six to eight years old, and they're just loving it, and they're just really, really embracing it. And, and, and that age group, and you think about what you do, and what you give to that age group. Look, I've coached men. I've coached some of the best rugby league players in the world, coached some, some of the best rugby union players in the world. But nothing gives me more enjoyment than to, to see these kids just laugh and, and just enjoy and develop. 
and develop in an environment that is learning, that is non-threatening, in an environment that it's okay to make mistakes because mistakes is part of learning, you know, and, and that's the sort of learning uh, that you want to be always giving kids is that you want to create that environment because it's, it's like anywhere. It's like your workplace. I said, you know, if you work at a place that if you make a mistake or make an error that you get reprimanded for, you, you're going to live in fear. You'll be working in fear all the time, afraid of making mistakes. So, therefore, you stop contributing. Mm-hmm. Stop really contributing in, 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 in a way that, that is open and more natural. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're in an environment, in, in your working environment, where, guys, I want you to contribute, I want you to, it doesn't matter if, if it's wrong, it's wrong. You know, we'll, you know, there's never a wrong way, there's always a better way. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. then you'd be more open to making suggestions. You think about somebody, you, you, you make a suggestion to, to your boss and your boss turn around and go, ah, oh, shut up, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Whereas if, if a boss turns around and goes, that's a great idea. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. Um, we'll put that, we'll, we'll take that idea, but, you know, he may not use it, but at least he's giving you a bit of confidence to say, hey, yes, you lost my idea. Because you never know. You might actually yes, contribute later on that, that may make a big difference. So it's creating that environment as a coach that, that allows people to, be, to have that freedom to try and not yeah. be afraid to try because if you don't get them trying, then they, they were, those are life skills that um, you're, you're stopping them from learning. So that's so music. So true. Nah. Thank, you. Thank you, brother. Pot yeah. over, eh? <laughs> Now that you are in Dubai, coaching. When you were, uh, when you took on that job, yep. did you for one minute think, yep, this is for me. I, I watch your uh, social media, I follow your social media page and I see you do good things with the kids, but did you for one minute Look at your journey, brother. From here to there to there to there. See? Alugo, alugo. Did you for one minute say, coaching, I found my, uh, I found my place. Or was it, <laughs> did you work, work up to it? No, nah, no, nah, not really. I, I, kind of, um, I kind of stumbled into coaching because of, because of my nature as a, a mentoring. I always used to mentor. I used to look after all the young players, even when I was playing. Ah. And and so when I was playing, I always used to support the young players. I never saw them as a threat, even mm-hmm. players that played in my position. You know, if, if they were young up and coming players that played in my position, I'll give them the, every time. You know, if I'll give them this all the support and and the mentoring that they you know that I can give them in order for me for them to be the best player they can possibly be. And that's always been my nature. And so I always supported them and I always enjoyed coaching. And so um, so it was accidentally I went into coaching and then ended up coaching at St. Helens and then moving to St. Well, moving to Dubai was an accident as well because uh, I came here, uh, dropped here on the way to New Zealand um, and got offered a job to uh, run the um, a new academy, which was a sports academy, which rugby was going to be one of its feature sports. And I said, okay, then I'll, um, I'll have a look at it. And then, you know, again, it was, a, it was an offer that I sort of it, it attracted me. And I thought, actually, this could be a change, change of scenery, change of um, location. Mm-hmm. So I ended up moving to Dubai. and But the academy ended up folding. It was during the um, it was during the financial crisis in 2009, and but the school that I was working in offered me a job as um, head of rugby. So I ended up becoming head of rugby, and then within a year, I became the um, head of PE, non qualified, mm-hmm. only non qualified PE teacher. <laughs> the following year, so I had been made. Within a year, I was made um, head of rugby. Then another year, I was made head of PE. And then the following year, I was made director of sports. 
for the whole school. And the school had two, two and a half thousand kids. And Mate, that's wonderful. One of the largest international schools here in Dubai. But the, the one of the reasons why I kind of made that, I just gradually just went up the, the ladder was because of my leadership skills from coaching. And from coaching in professional, you 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 had to manage people. You had to manage players full time. Uh, that was a responsibility that I had as a coach, you know, in, in the professional um, realm. So to come to teaching in a, in a large international school and then to manage, I think we had about 16 PE teachers at the time. And I had to manage a team of, uh, of PE teachers. And it was easy, it came easy to me because, you know, I built a culture around sort of team, uh, team connectivity. And, and I was able to put these, the, connect all these guys together, make it more um, functional, and you know, everybody had a role to play within our within our school, within our department, and so that's how I kind of that's how I operate. It's all about you know team connectivity. I'm I'm a high performance coach, and and um, and I build high performing teams, and so whether it be on the rugby field or whether it be in the classroom or being you know anywhere or be in the office. So um, that, that was my journey. So, so I ended up being in a, in a school. So, but at the same time, I started my own rugby ca- academy in 2010. So this is coming out, this is its 10 year anniversary. And it's been the largest rugby academy in the, in the region. Um, and we're all about environments, creating the environments and it's a development environment and it's all about skills and developing the child as well as the game. Fundamentals of the game, but the um, but I guess the the my main role is and so coaching and then um, in 2016 I was offered the position of high performance uh, manager for all of UAE rugby. So I look after all of rugby in this in this in this um, in the country. So it's um, it's a role where uh, it's overseeing the development of the game. And, and also sort of maintaining the, the, the governance that's come from World Rugby down to, uh, down to our country and region. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different roles and responsibilities, but, you know, and as long as I'm enjoying and I'm learning and I'm growing and contributing, then that's good for me. And I, and I just keep doing it, you know, and just keep developing myself, you know, um, during, during lockdown, it was, people say, you know, was it challenging? I said, the first three weeks was challenging. I think because it was still uncertain. Everybody didn't know what was happening. Yeah, yeah. Didn't know. So you kind of, you, you, you tethered through it for three weeks, kind of, working sort of navigating your way through it mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you then you that sense of like uncertainty actually drives you to find something that could be certain you know and then i think sometimes when we see uncertainty we're afraid of the uncertainty because you want everything to be certain yeah so the uncertainty actually drove you to be more creative drives you to be more think outside of the box to come out of the lane that you're normally in, you know, look at the other lanes that you can possibly move into. You know? and, and, that, and that was a growing experience for me. And I probably, I've come out of this, well, we're still in COVID, but I'm always learning. I'm, I'm learning new things and doing new things. Um, I've got a, a lot of new things in uh, the pipeline that I'm, I'm looking to develop and, 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 um, and take further. And, but it's, it's, if you're not growing, then you know, you know, you know, you're dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, mate. W- one of the good things I um I appreciate, or one of the things that I appreciate um, watching um, through your social media platform is the basics. Ah, yeah. ball, pass, ball, draw, pass, pass. I can see the relations between you taking that and applying it to your business. You you mentioned non qualified. <laughs> you are a very smart person, brother. <laughs> Taking what you've learned and you've applied that to your business, like the simple thing of ball, draw the man, and pass. I think you are very astute and very smart, smart 
follow them, bro. <laughs> See, on the years I've known you, we've all gone different places around the world, but I am so, 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 so fascinated and excited to hear this journey that you've taken. Did you, as a follow-up back in Calston, ever, this sounds like a cliche, bro, but did you ever think, Apollo, I'm going there. No way. No way. Mate, I had a dream to become a cop. I wanted to be a policeman. Yeah, I wanted to be a policeman. I, I, um, the being part and, and contributing to a community was, was and supporting a community was probably a, a big drive in my, um, in my mind, in my mindset back in that days. Um, I actually went and both Inga and I, when we were 17, we, we were going to apply for the force. <laughs> I yeah. had no idea. Wow. Yeah, we, yeah, we were serious and, and having a look at, um, we were searching um, to try and, and look at, 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 at uh, the possibility of going into the police when we uh, left school. But that, you know, that was you know, back then. So, I look, I... I had no dreams of where I am now, never had envisaged, never in the wildest, never in a hundred years would I have been, been able to, to, to have planned this. Mm. This is not, I didn't plan this. This has all kind of come about as, as part of my journey, kind of, you know, the more you grow, the, 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 the <laughs> it's like a bit like a tree, the more you grow, the more branches you know, sprout yeah. out, and you know, you come up here, you're thinking, "What's going on? Where am I going now?" You know, you like you move into this year. And I, I had no idea I'd be in, I'd be in Dubai. It, you mm -hmm. know, no, I had, I had never ever dreamed of, you know, living in Dubai. I actually thought I was going to live in New Zealand, um, work in, in 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 the UK, and then eventually move back to New Zealand. Um, but now, um, no, I don't. You know, because Look, you, you, um, you're in control of the journey most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, there are times, sometimes there are things that are out of your control that you can't control. But majority of the time, you, you're, <laughs> you've got the steering wheel, you know, and, <laughs> and you determine where, you know, where to go, you know, and, you, and, you know, depending on your drive and your, and your motivation, you know, and your, um, and your um, your desire will depend on which which direction you take, you know. And you know, and I think in my drive and desire is to to do the to be the best that I can possibly be at what I'm passionate about, you know. And that you know, and then you know, it's it's, it's funny because people say, "Well, what are you passionate about?" I said, "If you had all the money in the world." Would you still be doing what you're doing now? I said, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You'll find the passion, the pass your true passion is something that you'll do regardless if you had all the money in the world. I said, you know, if I had all the money in the world, I'll be coaching all over the world. There you go. So uh, so people, you know, people say if you're looking for what is your passion? I said, passion is something that that drive that you would do, even if you can afford not, you know, not to do it, you know, and, and you you do it anyway. And so, if I had millions and millions of dollars in my bank account, I'll still be coaching, but I'll be coaching all over the world, and I'll still be coaching this age group. I'll be coaching kids, I'll be inspiring kids, and I'll be motivating kids, and I'll be creating environments, which is what I enjoy because I see. The best, best opportunity for kids is to is to succeed, is to give them the environment to grow, and that's um, that's where I am at, bro. <laughs> Brother, wonderful, wonderful. Hey, I think it's time you should come back and uh, we'll go back and coach the boys. But I think <laughs> it'll be just one laughing session. <laughs> it would be just one whole laughing session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to, uh, time is moving on, but I'd like to quickly touch on uh, the, the family 
and your kids. You talk about uh, coaching kids, inspiring them. You have kids of your own. Was it hard for you? Because uh, you, you were playing at this level and your kids, as they got older, they would soon realize where you were playing at. Was it hard for you to motivate your kids and to nurture them along? Um, look, I, I, did I want them to play rugby? Not really. I, I wanted them to play sports. I wanted them to be to be active. I wanted them to find a passion for an activity. Um, did I actually want them to be in... Look, my kids did swimming. They did tennis. They're good swimmers. They, you know, they... They did, um, they, they did swimming lessons from a very young age, you know. That's one thing that I made sure that they learned to swim because I never learned to swim when I was a kid. I only learned to swim later on when I became a professional rugby player that I had to swim in order for it to get fit and do some of my recovery. You know, when I had a knee injury, I was in the pool pretty much every day, you know, down the pool. And, but... When I think about my kids, you know, I, I gave them every opportunity to grow a passion for a, a sport. You know, they did tennis. We had tennis lessons. We had, um, we had tennis lessons. They did, um, what you call it, um, the swimming. And we tried to um, in, encourage them into football, you know, to, uh, to soccer. You know, and then you know, they don't play rugby. But, they, you know, look, as a rugby parent, as you know, I, it didn't matter for me whether they did well or, or you know, I just wanted them to enjoy it. Um, and, and that's the difference. And I, I think sometimes the underlying um, sort of um, sort of belief was always that I, that because I was a professional and because I was an international rugby player, that I want my kids to be the same. Absolutely not. It didn't. I, did, I never put the pressure on them to, to succeed in, in the sport that I was at, uh, that I was good at. I wanted them to be good in whatever they wanted to be. Um, although my younger son is now chasing, the, you know, he's chasing, he's chasing the contract. He's a good, he's gifted player. But but that was his own decision, not mine. You know, he decided to do that. He decided to move to Auckland um, at fifteen. Um, and he went to King's College. Didn't go to Kelston. Went to King's. <laughs> hey, anyway. but, what, what happened, bro? What happened to Kelston? He yeah, we went, we went from uh, one end to the other. <laughs> you know, his dad went to a low decile school, and uh, his son went to a highly affluent uh, school. You know, very, very affluent school, but. That was his decision. He he chose to to go to New Zealand. He chose Kings as his school. Um, you know, we all we wanted, all he wanted from us is just our support. And you know, for for us to say, yeah, it's okay, go for it. And so, and, and you know, my eldest boy, he went to university in England. And he rang me and he said, uh, Dad, can I talk to you? And I said, Yeah. And he says, uh, um, I wanted to say that I'm, uh, I want to drop out of rugby. I'm not going to really take it seriously. And I said, so what do you want me to do? He says, oh, I just just wanted to let you know because just in case you might be disappointed. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> do what you want. <laughs> I said, do what you want. I said, you know, mate, if you want to play rugby, you play rugby. If you don't want to play rugby, you don't have to. You know, this is, you know, I, it was different for me. Different for me. And, like what we parent our parents when they moved us to from the islands to New Zealand, they put us on the next rung of the ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He moving from New Zealand to the UK and then on to Dubai, I moved the family up to the next rung of the ladder, so that my kids started at a different platform. They don't start at the same platform. I was never gonna. If my kids said to me, "I want to go to the same school that you went to," I said, "No way." Awesome. <laughs> no, no way! Yeah, you gave that go test. No, and, and and it was always going to be the next step up. Next, you know, next step up. It was always, um, I was always gonna. And my kids didn't need to pursue rugby as a profession because I had already done that. They can pursue something that's a little bit higher than that. 
And people might go, oh, you saying that rugby's nice? No, it, no, I'm saying that it's a limited job. <laughs> it's a limited job. My, my rugby exploitations and playing professionally was limited. I knew that I can only play till 32, 33. I retired at 33, even though I probably had another three or four years in me. Right, right, right. I'm done. I'm done. You know, I needed to choose something else. Whereas, you know, if you, whereas if you get a professional um, sort of um, qualification, you can be a lawyer uh, all your whole life. <laughs> you can be a yeah, you can be a computer analyst or computer programmer for the rest of your life. But rugby, you only you know you only a player for for so long. So that's why I didn't want them to to kind of choose that pathway because it's um it's a limited pathway, you know. And there's there's only so many coaches that can coach. Yeah, yeah, And I don't want to be a coach at top level. I'm being there, done that. <laughs> I want to support the coaches there at the lower level. <laughs> well, I think you, you you do a great job in that. Maybe that's your next job. You're the support guy that lifts everyone up, which you reminded me of how it's a community thing. It's not about you. When you elevate others, you um, instinctively elevate you as well. So that is a great quality to be a coach, but, but not just a coach brother as a parent and mm -hmm. it's wonderful that you are supporting your kids, the sports kids, but also your own kids in that they have the confidence to speak to you and say, dad, that's all they want to say is your support. And mm -hmm. brother, your support is massive. So with that, thank you so much. My love, beautiful brother, for this thank wonderful you. conversation. Uh, I know folks out there, there's a lot more to say. Perhaps we'll save that for the film as Apollo was, <laughs> was mentioning beforehand. Trust me, there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a lot more. Um, mate, I'll uh, close our talk story for now. And um, to everybody out there, I hope that from listening and watching this conversation that you are inspired and motivated to go for it and to reach your goal. It doesn't matter what it is, and as Apollo has uh, spoken about, it doesn't matter what it is. As long as you're committed to it and you have that framework behind you, you can get it. And you, you should, you should go for it. So I wish you all the best. Go for it. And to my wonderful guest here, the old friend from way back, AP, Maro Pitoy, Fifty Lover, for your time and for sharing your wonderful story to inspire. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Ciao. Yeah.